strange guys as a member of the University of Surrey because until very recently I was at the University of Sheffield. Indeed I was, or I am now the former acting director of the USRC, so that's my official title. Um, so yeah, I'm a lecturer in psychology and I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we should care what, what lay publics think about new technologies. Um, a little bit about who I am and what I do. So my research on environmental psychologists what the hell is environmental psychology of the UK, right? Um, well, basically, it's the study of the interrelationships that people share with attributes of the natural and built environment. So, how do we as people impact the environment, how do we change the environment, but also how does environmental change impact upon us as individuals? Now, under this sort of this broad um, sort of uh, area of psychology, I study two key things. So, theme one is looking at the social acceptance of energy technology. So, trying to assess attitudes and behaviours towards um, established and emerging energy technologies, and also looking at the implications uh, for these technologies, uh, for um, of these attitudes, for things like public engagement, communication, um, efforts, implications for planning decisions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's, it's this area which I'm going to be focused on today. But just to also note that I do have a secondary theme which I'm interested in, which is how do we make people act more pro-environmentally? So um, I'm interested in assessing some of the factors which will facilitate or inhibit people in terms of acting in a pro-environmental way. And again, environmental psychology is quite good at, at working at the interface with the real world. And so I'm very much interested in trying to understand the, the real world implications for my work. And one of the areas which I'm interested in here is looking at how uh, business and industry efforts to try and convince us to act more sustainably are received by members of the general public and responded to by those members of the general population. Um, now, the social acceptance of new technologies is a complicated thing. Often it's perceived to be quite a simplistic thing. Often we, re we refer to this, this general public. And in doing so, we kind of assume that the public is very homogeneous, very samey, they're going to respond in the same kinds of ways, to the same kinds of triggers. And that simply is not the case. People are very, very different. And if we're looking at society more generally, we're not just talking about publics. We're talking about other stakeholders. We're talking about policy makers. We're talking about businesses. And so this... A uh, triangle here, this triangle of social acceptance, as proposed by Wilson Harvard and colleagues about 10 years ago, um, actually is there to illustrate the complexity of the situation. If we're looking to understand the social acceptance of technologies, we have to look at the manifold factors and actors which are governing acceptance at a number of different levels. So at the sort of the very top level here, the general level, we have general socio-political level acceptance. So what does general society think of an emerging technology or policy option? What do general people general lay publics think of the technology? What do other key stakeholders, policy makers, what do government think of it? Now beneath that, we also have some more specific forms of acceptance as well. So these are the corners of the triangle. So we have market level acceptance. So what do consumers of technology think of the technology? Are they going to be willing to have it in their home? What do investors in technology think as well? You're not going to get development of technology if people aren't willing to invest in it. So what do investors think? What do people operating within firms who are developing these technologies think of these technologies. So market level acceptance is an important thing. Uh, and also if we're intent on building large facilities and communities, we have to look at community level acceptance as well. So what do people living within host communities or, or communities earmarked to host developments uh, think of the technology? Are they going to be willing to accept it, reject it? And there's a number of considerations which, which uh, are brought to bear on this level of community acceptance. For example, people will sometimes be very attuned to uh, procedural issues, so whether or not they think that decision making uh, which is affecting them in their community is fair or not. And people are also uh, very aware of, of um, issues of distributive justice as well. So are they being unfairly targeted by developers? Often um, uh, facility development will be get more facility development. Once you've built something in the community, well, hey, they like these kinds of things, let's build more of them there. Is this fair? Well, perhaps not. Sometimes people feel unfairly targeted. So these kinds of issues of procedural justice, distributive justice, trust in developers are all brought to bear on whether or not uh, technologies will be socially acceptable. So this is here it's just to illustrate the complexity of the situation. Now what is interesting for me as a psychologist is that people are operating at each of these corners. And lay publics are operating at each of these corners as well. So in our roles as general voting citizens, uh, consumers of technology and recipients of technology, there are publics everywhere. And so understanding what publics think of these technologies should be a forethought because these publics are going to affect whether or not these technologies see the light of day. However, what is quite interesting 
um, is that the public acceptance of technological innovation is often an afterthought. And that's exemplified here within this quote, which comes from uh, Jay Apt and Birk Fischoff, who are a technologist and a psychologist. And they're saying that without public acceptance, it's going to be impossible for electric sector innovations to get regulatory approval, find sites, secure funding in order to actually ensure their commercial success. However, all too often, public facing new technologies is an afterthought. We tend to only really consider what publics think about new technologies when something goes wrong. When we try and say, right, we're going to build this here, aren't we? And they go, no, you're not. And we go, well, why not? So something's gone wrong there. And the problem here is that it's the wrong way around. We should be actually understanding a little bit more about what publics think of technology in order to try and circumvent those issues where we're trying to sort of build something somewhere and then it's only lastly we find out that there are objections to that. So we should be caring what the publics think about this. And this is particularly relevant as well to um, energy storage technologies because people are going to be interacting with these technologies in a number of different ways. I mean, broadly speaking, we can conceptualise energy storage technologies as falling into two categories. So we have large centralised energy storage systems, so large-scale pumped hydro, uh, compressed air energy storage, large-scale battery systems, like the one in Willenhall. Um, but we also have domestic-scale storage systems as well, so things that people are probably familiar with, like storage heaters, and we've already heard about things like vehicle-to-grid initiatives. So people are interacting with these technologies, <coughs> these different technologies at different levels. And what is quite interesting is that currently there's been relatively little research into what publics think of these technologies, and little attempts to try and engage uh, publics in debates about these technologies. However, what we also know is that failures to engage publics, failures to actually find out what people think and respond appropriately to those thoughts can land us in trouble. It can lead to curtailments, delays in the introductions of technologies at a national and local level. And that's exemplified within a number of recent cases. Nuclear power is an obvious one. Fracking is a very current one, of course. Uh, this is uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, and of course, green farm development. These are all examples of what can go wrong. So what are the factors then which are likely to shape public's opinions of these kinds of large centralised systems and more domestic scale systems? Well, this is a kind of a list, it's not an exhaustive list of some of the factors which are likely to be of relevance. This comes from a science-wide report published a few years ago. And just to put out a few of them, so if we're talking about large centralised systems, um, if we're introducing new large pieces of technology into communities, new facilities, there are going to be perceived risks with that. You know, if we're introducing battery systems in, well, what are the potential toxicity of the materials there? If we're talking about compressed air energy storage systems, you know, is there a risk of explosion? So understanding the perceived risks associated with uh, these technologies is going to be important because people will respond to these perceived risks. Another key one is the scale and proximity of proposed development. People will often think differently about technologies when you're talking about them in a general sense, what do you think of wind power in general? Well, that's a good thing. And a local sense, what do you think about wind farm development in your local community? No, I don't like it. So there's often a discrepancy there, which is related to sometimes the scale, but also to the proximity of the proposed development. This is where the NIMBY term comes from, not in my backyard. The perception that people are objecting to this development because it's close to them and because it's affecting them personally. So these kinds of Issues of scale and proximity, these issues of distributive and procedural justice, which I mentioned, and trust are all going to be important things in shaping how people think of new technology. So we have to be aware of these factors. At a domestic scale as well, there are other considerations which are going to shape whether or not people will be willing to adopt technology. We know from key models of technology acceptance that things like the perceived utility, the usefulness of the technology, and how easy it is to use perceptively will govern whether or not people will intend to buy and use it. We also know that at a household level, people are very sort of uh, acutely aware of, of the financial costs of these technologies, or potential financial benefits. And so, sort of financial incentives, compensations, ownership opportunities for the technologies can be a good lever for stimulating acceptance. Um, also, what we know is that people are creatures of habit, and they don't really like to change what they do. People are resistant to change. And so, if you can develop technologies and introduce technologies which appropriately fit to existing habits, routines, they're more likely to be accepted than those which are particularly disruptive. And people also like things which look nice. So it's important then to do work into understanding people's attitudes, to understanding the nature of these attitudes and, and what is behind those attitudes. Because in the absence of systematic, reliable uh, data on these things, moderately informed speculation is the best we can hope to offer. This is one of my favourite quotes. So we have to do our homework. Just an example of some of the homework which is being done. We are beginning to see an increase 
in uh, research interest into energy storage technologies. One area which is increasingly receiving interest is around electrical energy storage, and we're beginning to get social intelligence on what people think at a socio-political level, but also at community and household levels uh, in relation to a large number of different technologies. Uh, including, for example, battery storage systems, a very recent article which came from, uh, from Australia looking at the, at the types of factors which are do, uh, driving consumer acceptance of the solar power and electrical energy storage system within homes in Australia. It was quite useful in showing what kinds of benefits people focused on uh, when they were making their decisions about their opinions of the technology. Maybe it's a bit fuzzy here, but what we find is that the key thing which is motivating people's opinions is the ability to save money on their household energy bills. Considerations for, for the environment tend to fall slightly further down uh, people's lists of uh, priorities. Um, how can we use these data? Well, these data are quite helpful in showing what kinds of levers you might want to press if you're interested in promoting the technology in order to try and stimulate acceptance of that technology. If people are very much fixated on the costs of their energy bills, and this is going to be something which is going to be useful in that regard, then you now have evidence to say, well, let's, let's push on that lever a little bit. Or alternatively, you can say, well, perhaps people aren't really uh, aware of the benefits of the, the, the technology would have for the environment, and so perhaps if we try and increase people's awareness of these benefits, then we can actually begin to use this lever as well in order to stimulate acceptance of that technology. So, we need to assess people's opinions. That's an important part of the equation. But we also have to think very carefully about how we assess people's opinions, particularly of new technologies, new things. Because what we know from psychology is that people are very, very willing to comment on things that they know about. They're equally willing to comment on things they know nothing about. And that can be problematic because we can then start registering what are sometimes called pseudo-attitudes or pseudo-opinions. This is where people are, are, are saying their opinion on something uh, that they know very, very little about. These are kind of weak, uninformed judgments. Why do people do this? A number of potential reasons why people will give you an answer to something they know nothing about. Uh, social pressure is one of them. So if you're in a kind of an interview situation or a survey situation, you have a kind of a social contract with the person. You are asking them questions and they are providing you answers. If you ask them a question and they don't provide you an answer, they feel a bit bad about it. Um, so they don't want to feel bad, so they'll give you an answer anyway. So there can be this kind of social pressure which leads people to answer. It can be your fault, you, it can be an instrumental issue, if you don't include don't know or not sure as a viable option within the question you're asking, you're forcing people to make an evaluative judgment, so it could be an instrumental error. It could be educated guesswork, so people like to think that they uh, know about things and they may listen to what you're saying, they may put two and two together and make four, which is good, uh, they may put two and two together and make five, so there's wrongful imputation there which is, is, is leading to an issue. And some people engage in what has been sort of term mental coin flipping. So you'll ask them a question, they really don't care, perhaps they're only completing the survey for the incentive that you've offered, and so they'll just, on the spot there, toss a coin in their head, and that will then determine whether or not they are in favour of or against the technology you're talking about. So manifold different reasons which people are likely to, to provide you with these uninformed judgments. And what is the problem here? Well, we know that these kinds of weak attitudes, these pseudo-attitudes, are, 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 are very changeable, very dynamic, they're going to mould and evolve in response to new information. We also know that they're very uh, non-directive of people's thoughts and behaviours as well. So, you know, you can assess these things, <coughs> whether or not it's going to govern how someone's going to act at a later time point isn't really very questionable. And so should we really be basing multi-million pound investment cycle decisions on these very, very flaky attitudes? Uh, perhaps not. So we have to think about the methods that we're using in order to assess opinions. And often when we're assessing people's opinions of new things, we need to use more qualitative, more in-depth methodologies interviewing, focus groups and things like that, because these methods allow us to check people's understandings of things before we register their opinions of those things. So if there is misperception, we can make sure that we correct that misperception so people know what they're answering about. And these kinds of qualitative methods will also allow us to provide more information to people than perhaps you'd be able to do in a simplistic survey setting. Now just to give you an example of the extent of these pseudo-opinions, uh, from my own research uh, a few years ago into uh, carbon dioxide utilisation technologies, so these are technologies which make use of CO2 uh, as a feedstock for the manufacture of products like cements and plastics, uh, we decided to try and identify what lay publics may think of this technology. Uh, we held some focus groups in order to explore people's opinions, but before we held these focus groups we asked people, um, do, you, do you like uh, CDU as a concept, so yes or no? 
so asking people about their attitudes. Uh, but also we asked them whether or not they knew anything about it or had heard of it. And 25%, so a quarter of our participants, actually said, yeah, CDU is a great thing, but I've never heard anything about it. So this is uh, perhaps uh, an example of the extent to which pseudo attitudes may be rife in your research. So uh, you have to uh, pay attention to these things. So once we've gone and assessed people's opinions about things, we also then have to think carefully about what we can conclude based upon those opinions that people have registered. Because sometimes what may appear to be the case is not the case. And this is exemplified by this so-called nimbyism thing, not in my backyard, and what I've got the nimby trap here. I've already mentioned that often what you will see around facility siting is that people are generally favourable to the thing but locally objectionable. So there's a gap in people's attitudes. At least there's an apparent gap in people's attitudes. And often people assume that that gap is explained by selfishness. Indeed, nimbyist thinking comes with a number of assumptions. So it assumes, as I mentioned, there's this gap. It assumes that this gap is related to geographical proximity. So people are only objecting to this technology because it's being built close to them. If you build it anywhere else, they're going to be fine with it. Flaky assumptions to start with. It also assumes, as I mentioned, that this gap, this apparent gap, is derived from ignorance or self-interest. So people just object to the technology locally because it's going to affect them personally. It's going to depreciate their house price or something like that. So there's a large number of assumptions here about uh, 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 nimbyism as a concept. And the problem is that these assumptions are going to drive how you deal with the situation. <coughs> so if you're assuming that people are in it for themselves, then you may try and get around that by paying people off. You know, if people are selfish, then everyone should have a price, and so long as you can hit that price, you're going to guarantee acceptance of that technology. The problem comes, though, when people aren't objecting for reasons of self-interest. You know, if people are objecting um, the way in which uh, the decisions are being made, they feel that there is an issue with procedural justice, then efforts to sort of pay people off may be perceived as bribery. This is going to reduce trust in you as an entity trying to propose this thing, and you're going to end up in the worst situation you started with. Indeed, what we know from research is that there are manifold reasons as to why people are objecting development locally. NIMBY is just one of them. Um, what we know, though, is that people will often object to things uh, which transcend self-interest. So sometimes people will be concerned about uh, the fate of a particular um, wildlife um, in the area, like badgers or something. Um, we also know that, that it's rare that people who are objecting to technology are ignorant about technology. Often your opponents of wind farms will be the most informed people about those wind farms. People don't always reject the technology as well. If we talk about NIMBYism, it's a rejection of the technology. But as I've already mentioned, people sometimes reject the process by which decisions are being made. And perhaps we could have actually circumvented the issue by engaging people in the decision-making process earlier on. Uh, and also, we know that objection is not always geographically constrained. It's not always the case that people will accept development of a technology anywhere other than in their backyard. Some people are called neighbors, not in anyone's backyard. And they just reject the technology on principle. And so they won't like it in their backyard, but they won't like it in Newcastle or in you know, Timbuktu or wherever you may be. So we have to be aware of what may be behind people's attitudes. We can't assume that we know what is giving rise to people's opinions when we register them. Um, I just want to end by introducing you to some mice. And I'll become apparent in a minute. People who went to Toronto will know what I mean. Um, I just want to end with this thing. Can the social scientists offer more than just an appraisal of what went wrong with the technology? I've already mentioned that often social scientists will get involved with technology when something goes wrong. And that's too late, really. What we should be doing is trying to integrate social scientists into the research, design, development, deployment process of new technologies. So including the social scientists earlier in the development cycle of technology. Um, now, my father and I actually had an article published uh, last year in the Carbon Research Journal, which we based around the town mouse and country mouse fable. Now, I'm not sure how many people have heard this fable. It's something which I uh, was read when I was a kid. But in essence, we have these two cousins. We have the country mouse there, country bumpkin, and we have the town mouse, a suave, sophisticated guy over here. Now, um, they decide that they're going to visit one another. So the town mouse goes to the country and samples a rustic deal of the countryside. But gets a bit bored, it's not for him. At the latest time, the country mouse was a town mouse and samples the high life, the hustle and bustle of the big city. Uh, but they're having a feast and they get interrupted by a dog and it's scary, and the country mouse says, No, this is not for me. So they kind of um, agree to go their separate ways to res respect one another's differences. So this is me here, uh, and this is my dad here, and just so happens we're wearing, wearing the right kinds of stuff as well for the mice, but not planned. Um, and within this article, which you, you, can, you can read, um, 
we're saying that it's kind of the perception that the inclusion of the social sciences is somehow delaying or limiting or stifling to the progress of new technologies means that there is only ever really limited, fleeting or delayed collaboration between social scientists and engineers. As I mentioned, we only tend to get involved when things go wrong. It's kind of voyeuristic, but it's uh, probably the wrong kind of thing. What we really need is earlier, more sustained collaboration, more upstream collaboration, more meaningful dialogue between social scientists and engineers around the development of technologies, such that we can, as social scientists, um, sort of tell you our social intelligence about what people think of new technologies, such that that can then be integrated into decisions about what kinds of technologies are being developed, how they're being promoted, in order to hopefully circumvent some of the issues that we are currently facing in the absence of this. So what we call for within this particular article is not a suburban mouse, that was one idea we came up with, but more of a suburban house. We're not saying that social scientists need to become engineers, and we don't say that engineers should be social scientists, or you know, a little bit of conversation would not be a bad thing. But what we need is a kind of a suburbia in the middle, a kind of a workspace where social scientists and engineers collaborate more effectively in earlier and more meaningful ways around the development of technologies, such that we can circumvent some of the issues that we're currently facing around the introduction of those technologies. And this, hopefully, is quite consistent with EPSERC's um, view of this multidisciplinary research future, um, which we're going to have in the UK when the UKRI or UCRI if you want to, is introduced. Um, so thank you for listening. This is me in Toronto. This is my before in the background. Um, if you have any questions, please do ask them, or you can email me uh, at Surrey, and I'll be happy to answer those questions that you have. So thank you.